Hello everyone. I'm Sergeant Major John Proctor from the 3rd Armored Corps Command Chaplain's Office at Fort Hood, Texas. And I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about the role of the 56 Mike, the Chaplain Assistant, in the religious advisement process. Religious advisement is extremely important on the contemporary battlefields that we are engaged in today because a lot of times religion itself is a driver of both conflict and stability. Our own society here in the United States is careening radically towards more and more secularism. And so the appreciation for and understanding of other cultures that uh, have a, a greater reliance on faith and religion than we do is often essential for commanders to understanding the dynamics of the battlefield. Also, sometimes even our own multinational partners. So religious advisement, as explained in Field Manual 1-05, is important because it is not only the advisement that we give our commanders internally, what the doctrine calls internal advisement, but also externally in the operating environment. But what I would like to say to everyone here is that the two skill sets for internal and external advisement are related. In fact, for you chaplain assistants, it's your ability to support and resource all the faith traditions that you do on your home installation, that same skill set is what translates to your ability to advise the commander in concert with your chaplains on the religious dynamics of the operating environment. For an example, when you set up for a Catholic Mass, you know it's much different than when you set up for the collective Protestant service. Those of you that support Jewish services and other types of religious services Notice the distinctions between the different groups. This ability to navigate between the different groups and understand their traditions, their heritage, their morals, their, their myths and theology, these types of uh, factors are what enables you to also translate the same skill set into external advisement. What I would like to do briefly with you right now is just to share my own personal experience of religious advisement in three different operations. The first was Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti in 1994. The second is Operation Iraqi Freedom 2003-2004. And the last was Operation Enduring Freedom in 2012-2013 in Afghanistan. As a young private first class joining my first duty station at Fort Carson, Colorado, I was assigned to the 52nd Engineer Combat Battalion Heavy. We deployed to Haiti in 1994 to do humanitarian assistance missions. My particular battalion built base camps for the 10th Mountain Division and Combined Joint Task Force 190. However, because of our unique assets as combat engineers, we also were uh, tasked to go and support a local orphanage in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Now, the country of Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And so it was our ability as the unit ministry team to network directly with the religious leaders in Port-au-Prince that gave us an inroad to uh, this orphanage. The orphanage itself was in great need of support. They needed a well, they needed beds, they needed a roof repaired, and they needed some other things. So the combat engineers from our battalion, based on the relationship that my chaplain and I had built with the pastor and the, uh, the orphanage, we're able to leverage our capabilities to provide this humanitarian assistance to the people of Haiti. But it was the unit ministry team that the command turned to because the natural uh, dialogue partner with these non-governmental organizations like this religiously uh, based uh, orphanage was the unit ministry team. So we were able to do good just by reaching out outside the wire and applying the same skills that we used to perform religious support inside the wire. In Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, I was a member of the 82nd Airborne Division and we were on the initial push of OIF-1. After we stopped dropping bombs and we started trying to stabilize the situation, my brigade combat team of 3,300 paratroopers found ourselves in southern uh, uh, Baghdad in a, what's called the Al Rashid District of about 1.5 million Iraqis. So 3,300 of us, 1.5 million of them. All the infrastructure had been completely destroyed by the war and the Ba'ath Party had evaporated. There was 1.5 million people in the Al-Rashid district and no one in charge. 
So very quickly we learned that the only people that could gather a crowd together and put out a message were the mosque preachers. So we had to engage the mosque preachers. So this did not come from the chaplains. This actually came from the general officers. General Petraeus was doing the same thing up north in Mosul with great success. So General Ricardi Sanchez uh, in Baghdad told us here in the 82nd, we're going to do the same thing as well as all of uh, Task Force Baghdad. So we all began to engage the religious leaders in our area with varying degrees of success and failure. One of the things that really helped Chaplain Jim Murphy and I was reaching out to the Christians in Al Rashid. The Christians were able to break things down for us using a Christian construct of understanding on how the Shia and the Sunni related to the government, to Saddam Hussein, to the coalition forces, and to one another. Their explanations were not intelligence. We didn't collect intelligence from the Christian religious leaders in Al Rashid. But what they did do is explain to us what the normal dynamics of the people were and from a religious perspective. Remembering the Shia were not able to practice Ashura or any of their other key festivals under the reign of Saddam Hussein from 1980 to 2003. So here we were in an environment where suddenly the Shia were taking pilgrimages and, and doing all kinds of other religious activities that we hadn't seen. We didn't have any playbook for. So it was through our dialogue with the Christians that helped us to approach the Muslims with a little bit more understanding and knowledge about the, the combat situation there in Al Rashid. What this did was help us to advise our commander and all of our effects teams on how we can approach the population as we wanted to stabilize the situation there in the Al Rashid district. And what I'd like to stop here and point out to you, chaplain assistants, uh, is that it was the chaplains and chaplain assistants together that were doing these engagements, especially in the non-permissive environment of 2003 in Baghdad. We, we not only provided security externally on the convoy, but internally in the actual engagement itself. So chaplain assistants were face to face with religious leaders from the Al Rashid district right there in Baghdad, Iraq. And it was again the same skill set that allowed us to support our Catholics, our Protestants, our LDS, our Jewish soldiers. That same skill set helped us to approach uh, the Muslim population in Al Rashid. The last thing I would like to talk about from my personal experience perspective is my deployment to Afghanistan in 2012-2013. This deployment was at division level and at the division level we were part of Regional Command South or the Combined Joint Task Force 3 and the mission statement when I arrived in August 2012 was counterinsurgency. Now counterinsurgency is the most complex form of warfare because it is primarily political in nature and secondarily is it oriented towards combat action. Also, in a counterinsurgency, the object or the, the end state is to transition as much uh, decision-making power and security uh, requirement to the host nation and for the coalition nations or the ISAF to step further and further into the background. So we had many challenges in Afghanistan in 2012-2013 and one of them was we were partnered with the RCA teams, the Religious and Cultural Advisement Team, which is roughly equivalent to religious support teams in coalition forces. So the Afghans had their own version of religious support teams. The dialogue partners that we were given were the 205th Corps in Kandahar. Lieutenant Colonel Shawali was the RCA officer in charge, but he was not a mullah. The actual mullah in RC South was a Sergeant First Class. Mullah Ramatullah was his name. And Mullah Rala Ramatullah, being an NCO, was my dialogue partner. So here I was as a chaplain assistant. We were doing conducting counterinsurgency missions in, in, uh, in southern Afghanistan, and I was the dialogue partner for the most influential Mullah in the 205th Corps, Afghan National Army. But again, it was my skills as a chaplain assistant that I practiced at home station, that I practiced in the field, and that I practiced uh, taking care of our own soldiers that helped me to build a strong relationship with Mullah Ramatullah based on personal trust. Being honest, open, transparent, 
and demonstrating care and empathy for the Afghan people and for Mullah Ramatullah's own mission as a Mullah who is an NCO. That's what helped us to develop a rapport that translated into some very helpful action. Mullah Ramatullah told us that, as with any other counterinsurgent, they needed to be the hero when the 205th Corps rolled into a village to conduct security sweeps. But too often, all they came with were weapons, power, and demonstrations of force. But they said that people needed humanitarian assistance items like school books and pencils and paper and soccer balls and coats and slippers for their feet and things like this, and they didn't have any. So, as a staff NCO, I went to all the agencies on the CJTF3 staff that I could find to help collect some of these items. But we were told they were held in reserve for things like floods, earthquakes, or other disasters. So, I didn't know what else to do. I actually set up a Facebook page and asked for donations from people back in the U.S. And the donations came flooding in. And what we were able to do, chaplain assistance, conducting counterinsurgency operations in Kandahar, Afghanistan, was bundle all these, um, all these donations of kids' clothes and shoes and school supplies and soccer balls and teddy bears and give these things to the Afghan National Army Religious and Cultural Affairs team so that they could be the hero in southern Afghanistan as their units conducted security sweeps against the Taliban and it actually worked out very well. We were able to put these items in the hands of the Religious and Cultural Affairs team. They were able to put them in the hands of their soldiers, the Afghan soldiers, and they had very positive effects on the way that the Afghan National Army was winning hearts and minds in southern Afghanistan. So the chaplain assistant, as you can see, can play a very important role for the religious advisement. Where do we obtain our knowledge of indigenous religions when we are working with Afghans, Iraqis, Haitians? People are so far outside of our own experience and culture. The best way to obtain practical knowledge that you can use in understanding the indigenous religions in your area of operation is to actually meet those people. So religious engagement and religious advisement work together. It's your engagement with the practitioners of religion in that country that will develop your understanding of that country. And then you in turn can use what you learn from your engagement to advise your command. Yes, it's always better to research academics, to have all the, the good knowledge products you need to get the background and the specifics to analyze the religious practices in your area of operations. But nothing is going to ever take the place of a face-to-face -face interaction with a practitioner of that faith. In Afghanistan in 2012-2013, we collected the, uh, well, we didn't collect, we actually downloaded the mosque reports that were collected by the information operations section, the information engagement team. These mosque reports were not being analyzed by anyone, but they showed a very clear picture of what the mullahs were preaching in southern Afghanistan, what they were for, what they were against. Everyone knows, as goes the mullahs, the madrasas, and the mosques, so goes the people. So the chaplain assistants in uh, CJTF3 at brigade level and division level collaborated on pulling together these re mosque reports and running them through an Afghan subject matter expert so that he could help us understand these preaching trends. What do they mean? What do they not mean? Which mosques were authorized to have preachers? Which mosques were not? Which mosques were being built uh, by the new government? Which mosques were old and enduring? Understanding these things from an Afghan perspective helped us to gain an understanding of ourselves that we could pass on to our commanders and other staff sections. And in this way, you see religious advisement is very practical from the chaplain assistant perspective. The last thing I want to say about religious advisement is chaplain assistants are combatants. There are some activities that chaplains should not partake in, such as psychological operations, military information support operations, and military deception. These are outside of the parameters 
of non-combatant activity. However, as 56 mics, it's right down the middle of what we do. So, you will have to continually, always work hand in hand with your command chaplain. You will, you're never going to be separated from that chaplain. But there is some activity that is better for the chaplain to know what you're doing, but not participate, it, participate in it, him or herself. Those types of activity are belong to staff NCOs like us who can engage in combatant activity. Even with that said, there are limits, right and left limits, that we should observe as chapel assistants when conducting religious advisement. We should never recommend targets for uh, lethal action because that's not what we do. What we do is just bring the understanding from a religious, theological, and moral perspective to the targeting process. The targeting officers and NCOs will determine what targets to strike, protect, or engage in non-lethal means. But without the presence of religious support teams in the targeting uh, process, we are often going to do things that are going to be very um, counterproductive to the commander's intent because we're operating in a religious environment and the, not uh, all of our staff members really understand who's out there, what their beliefs are, and how we are to approach this, especially if the mission statement is something like counterinsurgency. So chaplain assistants, what I'm challenging you to do today is to apply yourself in, in your self-development domain of, of training. Because we don't really have the kind of institutional training out there yet to professionalize these skills for you. But you do have a brain and a heart and a will and a lot of skills, knowledge, and ability that are untapped potential. So I'm challenging you to apply yourself to learn about all the faiths and traditions and religions that are in your own commander's formation right here in CONUS. When you really begin to understand who you're supporting, what their traditions are, what their requirements are, feasts, festivals, holidays, the same skill set that you obtain here in CONUS is going to be easily applied to the external advisement process in the operating environment. But again, you have to take it on yourself to apply these skills, knowledge, and ability that you, you can acquire on your own because there really is no forcing function out there today that says if you don't do it, here's what will happen to you. Now, the reality is once you go into an operating environment, your commander is going to expect the religious support team, chaplain and chaplain assistant, to be his or her advisor on religion's effects on operations. If you don't do anything to prepare yourself and then you're in an operational area and then they turn to you, it can be ugly. So what I'm asking you to do now is to develop your skills, knowledge, and ability as individual chaplains and chaplain assistants so that you can apply the same skill set that helps you navigate friendly forces to help you navigate the external advisement process in the operating environment. I shared some personal experiences with you this morning that I think will be helpful. Um, my personal experiences are just that. They're not doctrine. They're not tactics, techniques, and procedures. They are a way. And I hope it's something that I said this morning will motivate you or inspire you to really dig into the religious advisement process and to extend your influence beyond just your own chain of command and be a difference maker. Something Chaplain Tim Bedsell told me years ago has always stuck with me, and that's this. When you talk about someone else's religion before your commander, staff, or soldiers, you need to speak about that religion as though the practitioners of that religion were in the room with you. So that kind of respect, that kind of reverence, that kind of uh, understanding of who's out there, who's in your target audience, is really important. So chaplain assistants, apply yourselves. Become good religious advisement professionals. And your commanders and your commanders and staff will be thankful but more than that, you can be a part of something that helps limit destruction on the battlefield, end conflict sooner, and promote conditions of stability and peace. I'm Sergeant Major John Proctor from the 3rd Armored Corps Chaplain's Office, and thank you for your time.